And so my friends, it's the moment you've all been waiting for. Final day, final match of the Skilling Open, Magnus Carlsen and Wesley So all tied up. I've put timestamps on the video player to jump around the games if you'd like. And I just want to thank all of you for your tremendous support over the course of these recaps. I will continue to make them as the top tournaments roll in. So make sure you are subscribed so you don't miss the thing to show some support because I try to work really hard to put the best content out there for all of you. It's also Magnus Carlsen's birthday. So happy birthday to him. Let's see if he got a nice birthday present. Okay, game time. Wesley has the white pieces. Wesley begins with e4 and Magnus Carlsen shocks the world by playing the move c6. Now the Karakhan defense is very popular, but to see it in such a high stakes event, also from Magnus Carlsen himself, who doesn't really play the Karakhan, surprising. Wesley chooses the most principled approach, which is the advanced Karakhan. And there's a lot of lines here, but he goes for knight d2 and knight b3. And the point is that he's playing against Magnus's break c5. So the early stage of the game was development, a5 to try to go a4. Now here Magnus does something incredibly strange. Bishop b4 check, c3, bishop f8. I can't quite explain it. Uh, even during the live broadcast, I didn't quite understand what all of that was. I think he's just uh, inviting a maneuvering position and there's a difference between the positioning of where this pawn is, but I'm not gonna lie. I can't explain it. So like I said, pieces were developed and Wesley went for this retreating idea, knight e1 to play bishop d3, trade and have a firm grasp over the c5 square. Magnus plays knight f5 and Wesley here had to play the move g4. But that's a bold move to play, it's the first game. So instead he plays queen c2 and breaks on the queen side with c4, but he blunders that after this there is the stunning move knight takes d4 and your queen and your knight cover the d4 square. But there's tension here with the bishops. So for example, if he were to play bishop takes g6, there would be knight takes uh, b3, forking. Uh, if he would have played uh, what he played in the game, like queen takes d4, uh, there is this. And even though the structure gets damaged, then your pawn is a little bit weak, Magnus castles out of danger, and queen takes g6 is possible, but it would come with a drawback of losing the e5 pawn. But Magnus potentially didn't see the Thunderbolt. Bishop takes h6. Oh, wow. And if you take this, well, I take, and at least I give you repetition, but maybe I can even play for a win. So instead, Magnus plays rook to f5, blocking out the queen. Queen e3, uh, bishop e3, sorry, and brings back the queen, offers a trade. Wesley blocks up the center with f4. Now Magnus says, uh-uh, you're not blocking up the center. G5, more gangster chess from El Gangster himself. And here, an even more gangster idea, knight c5, g4, and rather than getting forced out, and this pawn chain being very dangerous, Magnus says, nah man, take my rook, I don't need it, I will take your bishop, then I will put my bishop on f6, then I will push my pawn, then I will push my other pawn, then I will push my other pawn again and fork you, and that's it, I'm simply winning. A very interesting exchange sacrifice here from Magnus. Uh, which basically led to a position where even though Wesley has two rooks, one of them is glued on defense. And this bishop is a re it's like the relative value of a piece as a game goes on. That bishop is not worth three points. The bishop is easily worth close to four points because of how powerful it is. Wesley's knight on e1, you're really going to tell me this is a three-point knight? That knight is worth like two and a half at most. Whereas Magnus's knight with the black pieces uh, is a killer. I mean, it's worth at least three and a half points. So Magnus, uh, in, in dominant fashion here, converts this position easily. He wins material, he brings his rook to the open file. This is not hanging because this would be a fork of the king and the rook. And Magnus is able to win this by picking up the pawns and then advancing his, uh, his queenside pawns. Notice what Magnus does here. He plays hopscotch with the knight, brings it all the way back to e7. Everything is guarded. There is no weaknesses. The pawns are blockaded so they cannot push forward. And the game ends with the B-pawn triumphantly going wee down the, you know, the flank of the board, a trade. But the pawn lands on B2, protected by the bishop. And there's nothing here. Knight D5 check. Knight C3 will come in the future and promotion. You have to be a little careful. Knight C3 does hang the pawn because you will disconnect the bishop. But long term, you will put the knight on one of these two squares and promote. Wesley so resigns, losing the game with the white pieces in the first round. Okay, let's see what happens in the second game. Magnus begins with the same opening we saw in game one yesterday. 
playing into CD5, CD4, this critical main line, where queens are traded, black accepts the fact that uh, they are giving away the bishop pair, so white has the bishop pair here, but black is a pawn up, and that pawn is going to be hard to regain. But you know what's interesting here, is that Magnus yesterday played the move bishop e3. Today he plays a new, new move, he plays rook d1, you say, well what's the difference? I mean, I don't understand, it's like, this isn't attacking anything. Well, we see that he retreats with the bishops and has very nice control of Wesley's position. Wesley brings up the rook to try to play king d8 and king c7 to hide the king behind the enemy pieces and open up the line for the bishop. But look at this position. Wesley is up one pawn, but Magnus, two rooks in the middle, bishops looking nice and pretty in the center, knight ready to jump in. King d8, and Magnus plays bishop d4. He could have played the move g4 with the idea to go g5, removing the defender of the central pawn. After bishop d4, Magnus blundered something. His idea here was to take and take this pawn, potentially, uh, to put pressure on Wesley, but bishop d6, a move that doesn't guard the knight, but adds a layer of protection to the king, right? Before it was just the knight covering the king, now it's the bishop. Here Magnus spent a lot of time, very evidently missing this move, and played knight a4, trying to outflank, offering a trade, and then playing g3, blocking out this bishop from ever hitting this way. Wesley played rook d8, and knight d5, putting his knight into the center of the board, looking for simplification, also covering the b6 square, maybe has knight b4 coming. Bishop g5 and knight f6 and knight c5, and Wesley said, chop, chop, h6. I'm gonna attack your bishop. What's the count? Wesley's up a pawn. Two knights versus two bishops. Very interesting knight. The horses versus the pointed hats. Who's gonna win? Bishops want open space. They want diagonals, they want long-range attacks, they want targets. The problem is, this is a very kind of close, close together position. There's too many pawns. And as we're going to see in a few moves, there are no more rooks. Wesley's structure is such that the light squared bishop has no clear target. Uh, the bishop on c1 has no clear target. And watch as Wesley glides down the center of the board. He plays king d6, brings his king. Drops back with the knights to target b3. Take, take, back. Push the pawn. Why does he push the pawn? Because this is his past pawn. That's the extra pawn. We have to invest in the extra pawn. Brings in the knight to c3. Pushes the pawn. Brings the king to the square that he just pushed the pawn to. b6. Why b6? Because this bishop was trying to sneak in. Again, the bishop found targets. So now we play against the targets. King d4. Knight d1 in this position, not possible. Forking the king and the bishop. Because you would hang your king. Don't hang your king. I actually personally think that illegal moves should be allowed. What I mean by that is, you should be allowed to play the move knight d1 in this position, and if you take the king, that is how you lose. I actually think that king capture would be a very interesting addition of the rules, because right now, if you just play this move, it doesn't let you. That's just my personal opinion. Let me know what you guys think. But obviously, there were no king hangs in this game, and Wesley just pushed Magnus to the final rank. Slowly, grinding out knight b1 here, beautiful move at the end. Um, and it took him a little while, the nerves were there, but he picked up a pawn... He defended his other pawn, traded on the king side, and once he won this pawn, the game is over. It's over because even though you can get close to this pawn, the knight is always guarding it. Now king moves, you can't take the knight because promotion, b4, b3, b2, b1, lights out. And Magnus Carlsen resigned the game. Wesley strikes back, stri strike backs, strikes back. It is now 3-3 three to three overall. Both players winning three games, no draws. Yesterday, everybody won with the white pieces. Today, so far, both games have been won with the black pieces. Insane, crazy, so much tension. So we go to game three. Wesley Sow's got the white pieces again. This game features the most absurd computer suggestion I have ever seen. So if you left before this, you'll never see what I say to you now, but ha! And if you're still here, thank you for being here. Okay. Ready. E4. Of course, Magnus got into trouble in the first game. Um, sorry, didn't get into trouble in the first game. So he repeats. Okay. We get a similar uh, advance, but C5. Now, C5 is one of the two main lines, and it's very good at a lower level. But engines have shown at the highest of levels that after takes an A3, white has an advantage. White threatens to play B4 here, defending this. So black has to take. 
And now Wesley plays the really cool move Queen G4. And you might say, well, of course, Magnus guards his pawn, except he doesn't. And Queen G7, taking this pawn is not... It's not the best move. Um, there's a variation where white wins two pawns, but black gets a huge lead in development. Notice how all of white's pieces are on the back rank. To a human eye, it looks, of course, you will just take, take. But engines have shown that here white is completely... Uh, sorry, black is completely okay, and white winning these two pawns is a little bit too dangerous. Which is why we get bishop d3. Uh, black surrounds the e5 pawn. And rather than playing the move which has been played the most to theory... Uh, to date, defending this pawn, Wesley plays a novelty. Now at this point, a novelty again, as I said, a move that's never been played. Never been played uh, in, in, in any chess database. I messaged Anish Giri on Twitter when this was happening, and I said, Anish, did he just refute the Karakhan? Now, castles, in these positions, white is winning like 80% of the time. 80% of the time in, in master, grandmaster level games. I asked Anish, so did he refute the Karakhan? Anish said, castles is very strong. But in pure Anish sarcasm, he also said, well, at least next time Magnus plays into this, he will be ready for castles. Who knows if he will do it. Now Wesley crawls forward. The reason you cannot take the pawn on e5 is because then queen g7 is actually very strong after the trade. So, queen h5. You cannot move the knight. Okay? b4 hits the bishop back, and again, there is no fork because of mate. So Magnus coordinates his pieces in such a way that e6 is defended, and he's playing bishop e8 to target the queen and plays the move f6. Wesley backs up. He still plays f6. Take, take, free pawn on e6, but Magnus finds the cool idea, knight c e7. The point is that now f5 is protected, for example, so you've slid this back. You've also overprotected the center. And what you're going to do is you're going to play bishop f7, and if you get to take here, uh, you will damage white's structure. That's the big idea here is bishop f7. Now, I promised you here the most savage engine line I have ever seen in my life. White can play rook ae1, just more, you know, kind of putting the pieces together, bishop f7, and rook takes f6. The point is that now the queen has no guard, so black cannot take, black will take the queen. And white will play the move. Rook takes knight leaving the queen hanging, gliding along the buffet of pieces, the rook cannot be taken because then the queen will be lost. If you lose the queen now, white has a big lead in material, so that's not good. So for example, the best move here for black, let's say black moves the queen all the way back, now I sack the rook again! The rook is walking on water! If black takes, I go here, sacrificing my second rook, if you take, I take the pawn with a discovered check, and I win your queen, and I win the game. So, the best move after rook takes g6 is to sacrifice the queen back on f3 to get another knight. Because the queen needs to take as much as it can before it gets captured. Now the best move is rook takes g7 check. Again, king takes rook. Discovered check. The queen is hanging on f3. King h6. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the best move is not to take the queen again, but to take the knight. I just want to have a moment of silence here to appreciate how utterly insane computers are. The final position of this, of this, of, of this whole thing is a bishop, knight, and three pawns for a queen and a rook. But because this king is so far out, knight f5 is basically leading to a checkmate. And the eval here is plus one. I promised you the craziest engine line you have ever seen. Happy birthday. Did this happen? No. Wesley played bishop b5. Blundering knight f4. A counterattack on his rook and his queen. Magnus didn't see it. Now Wesley played rook f6, but now the difference is that he traded the queens and brought back his material. Wesley here is down a bishop and one pawn for a rook, which is one point. But quickly the pieces actually got traded, and then Magnus blundered a repetition of moves a few moves later. Uh, Wesley got a very nice activity here with, with the open file. Very tough position for Magnus. Um, and then here, just a repetition of moves. Uh, Black's rook is completely stuck, because if it moves to, for example, let's say c7 rather than c4, I'll play rook c1 and you can't move your bishop. So a problem here. And, uh, well, the game ends in a draw. Who is happier in that draw? <laughs> Listen, only the chess gods know. Final game. 
Magnus Carlsen, final game of the Rapid, potentially. Magnus Carlsen, white pieces. Wesley so black pieces. Of course, Magnus Carlsen will play for a win. No, just kidding. He will play for Berlin. The most solid defense. You know why? Because he wants to play Blitz against Wesley So. And the players move their pieces out. They did what players in the Berlin do. Berlin defense, you notice how everything is symmetrical. Both sides have Queen, Knight, Bishop, Rook, same pawns. And uh, right in this position, the game was agreed to a draw. Now, what's funny is the regulations say you cannot agree to a draw before move 40. You have to repeat moves. But the players did it. And I don't know, they just broke the rules. I don't... I have nothing else to say, they just straight up broke the rules. So, we go to Blitz. Blitz is two games. Five minutes, three second bonus time every time you make a move. Magnus Carlsen gets to choose what color he begins with. Why? Because he's the higher seed from the preliminary round. He chooses the black pieces. Wesley so chooses E4. Magnus Carlsen, of course, will finally change it up. No, he plays the Karakhan, and he goes back to this system. He changes his move order a little bit, plays H6, Knight, E7, A5, and does something very peculiar, Queen, B6. Why? Where is the Queen going? It cannot target anything over here. Well, now Wesley plays a very common idea. Look at this pawn on A5. Queen, E1, Knight, B3, Bishop, D2, and Queen, E1. Who's gonna guard this pawn? Magnus says, well, bishop b4, but then they trade, and Wesley plays bishop d3, and he has a very simple plan here. Boop, and boop, and then boop, and we, he wins a pawn. Boop, 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 the triple boop attack. So Magnus plays c5, blundering bishop b5 in this position, which would have won the game on the spot, because the knight is pinned to the king, and so for example, something like this, knight c5 check, and up a pawn, this is, this is terrible, game is over. Wesley plays the simpler version, which is just winning the pawn. And then instead of this being one back, you get check and rookie one. Wesley so is in cruise control, simply a pawn up. Also finds a nice idea here not to take back, but glue the queen side together and then go back and win his pawn. Magnus begins counterplay. Bishop e4, f6, g5. He has to create counterplay on this side of the board. At this point, Wesley is also getting very low on time. Uh, you can see that he's very nervous based on the way he's playing. G3, knight goes back, take, take. And Wesley here, of course, should keep the position closed with the move H5. But he trades. And now, oh my goodness, Magnus Carlsen is back in the game. The knight is active. Rook H8. Wesley plays F3. A blunder because of the dynamite move. Rook takes H2 on the board. The problem here is that if you play F takes E4, I am bringing the bad boys. They're on the way. You should have never messed with the open H file. So Wesley plays King H2. Take, take, take. And just says, look man, if I play Rook F1, he's gonna go G4. So I have to go C6 counterplay on the, on the other side of the board. Magnus here should have played take and tried to create counterplay, but he rushed it. He created the move d4. Now we get rook f1, and here's the difference. Here's the difference. If you play g4, your bishop no longer guards the pawn because it's pinned to the king. So, rook f1, rook h8 check, bang, 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 million dollar move. What do you take the rook back with? Yes, the bishop. Why? This pawn can be taken. If it's taken with the pawn, then we lose the bishop. So bishop takes, this is the problem, b5. The bishop gets out of the way, and the two-on-one on the queen side is victorious for white. Because after this, bang, 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 no one's stopping you from promoting. If the bishop goes to c6, the bishop has dropped back and will trade itself for your bishop. Black's king is just too far away, and after d3, take king e5, a7, bishop, bishop back, Magnus Carlsen resigns. Magnus Carlsen blundering into a losing endgame in the first game of Blitz. Down 1-0 now against Wesley So. What? What timeline are we living in? What timeline are we living in? Okay. So it comes down to potentially the final Blitz game, or there will be Armageddon. Magnus Carlsen with the white pieces. Can he save the match? D4. Same thing we've had, but this time he plays E3. Symmetrical structure. And he actually plays into a position where the players get an endgame with no queens. Now, a middle game, I should say, with no queens. 
This position is okay for white, it's a touch better because of course black's king is in the center and one small detail, black has pawns extended outward. They could be targets. So Magnus rotates the knight over here to b3. Then he goes for the pair of bishops. This is all the imbalance that a guy like Magnus Carlsen needs. He just needs knight for bishop or bishop for knight and a small imbalance of the pawn structure and the fact that his opponent is absolutely terrified because he's playing Magnus Carlsen and he's winning and if he wins, he wins the whole match. Magnus also has the, that effect that he's Magnus Carlsen. So bishop d2, rook c7, and rook d1. It's time to centralize the rooks. We get rook c8, bishop e1, bishop d6, because, you know, if he retreats my, his bishop, I should retreat my bishop. And here Wesley so blunders. Wesley so blunders, the move, bishop takes b5. I told you about putting your pawns out there. They're going to be targets. The point is that now the bishop has stumbled into a fork. So now, since the bishop has moved, there is this. Wesley plays rook c6, but there's a new fork on a7. So now, Wesley has to give away one of the rooks. And what is the biggest advantage here of these two pawns? But notice, Wesley puts some pressure. Maybe here, Magnus should sacrifice one of the pawns and just go, just go, just push, invest in the a pawn. But Magnus, not so simple. He wants to keep the pawns, but now rook a8, a3. But how does white move the pawns now? If you push, I take. If you push, I take. So Wesley plays knight d5. Rook c1 and f5. h3 and g5. King f1 and h5. Who the heck is playing for a win? I thought Magnus was playing for a win. Wesley has no problems. He just takes space. He plays g4. Why does he do this? The more pawns you trade, the faster the game is going to get into a draw. He plays g4. Magnus plays king e2. Knight f6 and f4. Oh my gosh. Is it Wesley who's actually playing this position for a win? Hg4. Wesley says, I don't need to take that pawn. I can take on e3 first. Take and knight g4. Hello. Is anybody going to protect the e3 pawn? Bishop h4 check. But the king just gives the, all the other pieces a hug. Hey guys. e4. Wesley again. Avoiding silly blunders. Check this out. If you just casually retreat the knight here, your king gets almost mated in the center of the board. Almost mated if you just lackadaisically move your knight. So Wesley says, danger levels. I've been watching Gotham Chess recaps on, on YouTube. I know about danger levels. I don't need to move my knight if I can put one of Magnus's pieces that's worth equal or more in danger. And that's why he doesn't move his knight. He moves the other knight and attacks the rook. Now Magnus plays rook cc1, but now knight takes g2 because a knight is worth as much as a bishop. Magnus plays bishop f2. Now we give a check because the king is worth more than the knight and would have to move. Now we take the pawn. Why? Because if he takes our knight, we are going to get a rook. And we're simplifying into a position where we don't have any problems. Check. King d7. Ed5. Bishop c1. Pawn takes c6. Knight takes c6. Rook c1. Knight c5. Rook c5. Rook a3. And when the dust settles, Magnus Carlsen has king and rook versus king and rook and one pawn. There was a flurry of captures. Every single piece flew off the board. And that's it. Wesley pushed this pawn. The rooks were traded. The, the, that's it. King and king, king versus king. Magnus Carlsen on his birthday. The favorite to win it. Loses to Wesley So. And Wesley So wins $30,000. And takes home the crown of the first tournament in the Champions Chess Tour. The Skilling Open. Did we expect this? Hell no. No. But oh my gosh, Wesley was bulletproof. I mean, his nerves were unbelievable, unmatched. To fight against Magnus Carlsen like this, he got something out of Magnus that nobody else could get. And that's, that's all I have for you today. Let's watch a clip. We'll watch the clip of the final reaction. And then we'll sign off. Of course, just like yesterday, I will provide a voiceover. But this was the final moments when the pieces were traded. Yay! Oh my gosh, there go the rooks. Magnus is like, damn! That darn Wesley. Wesley's like, yay! Woo! And Magnus like, looks over. And is like, where's my mouse? I'm gonna throw my mouse now. I don't like my mouse. Ugh. And Wesley's like, oh man, Magnus is angry. Uh...
I better get out of here. Magnus doesn't look too happy. Alright, I'm gone. Bye, guys. I'm gonna go celebrate with my cat in my giant house. And that, my friends, is how it all ended. Magnus Carlsen losing to Wesley So in the final of the Skilling Open. Congratulations, Wesley, on a fantastic tournament. And thank you to all of you for making it this far in the video. You're amazing. Uh, I'm kind of speechless. Uh, I'm blown away by the support that you guys have been showing on these videos. They've been getting thousands of comments. <laughs> and I've been enjoying reading them so much. So stay tuned. More videos will be coming. And uh, throughout the whole tour, I'll be making these recaps. So take care. And I'll see you in the next video.